Bridge is server-led by people just like you. Everything you see and experience on a Sunday, from the front lawn to parking, the donuts, rocking babies, teaching our children, training students for mission, worship, ushers, greeters, lyrics on the screen, you name it. And there's likely a team of faith bridgers just like you putting their faith into action to get it done. So today we say thank you. Thanks for the coffee. Thanks for putting the lyrics on the screen so I can sing and worship. Gracias por ayudarme y involucrarme más en la iglesia. Thanks for running the camera so I can watch online. Thank you so much for keeping the front lawn looking great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for helping us park and get into church. Thank you for helping me raise my student. Thanks for serving with my kids so I can go to service on Sunday. Thank you for the donuts. Thank you for your hard work, your sacrifice, your cheerful smiles, and the impact you make for the kingdom. We appreciate you. Amen to that. Hey, welcome. We are thankful for you. And uh, particularly if you're a guest or a visitor, really glad that you came over today. So... We're gonna finish up a series that we started several weeks ago, five parts that we've been calling Resync, which has just been a season for us to talk about how can I get my heart reconnected to heaven in the midst of my very busy life. We've been talking about how there's, there's just some disciplines, um, uh, some, some routines, some streams that if we'll get in them, it really helps us to keep a heart that's synced up with the Lord. So we're going to finish that one up uh, today, and we're going to turn in New Testament, the New Testament, to 1 Corinthians 12. So why don't you take your Bible, 1 Corinthians 12. If you would like to follow along on a Bible, in a Bible, and you don't have one, just wave at one of the ushers right now. They're bringing them down, and they'd be glad to let you borrow one, and you can even uh, keep it if you don't have one. It'd be our gift to you. So... My boys love anything that's related to sports. Subsequently, we have had a lot of NBA basketball on here in the recent weeks. Um, because if you didn't know, the Houston Rockets are progressing rather nicely. And the odds are that they probably will survive the current series and push one series further into the playoffs. That'll put them in the final four of uh, professional basketball. And my boys, they've been dreaming. Dad, do you think they could get past the Warriors? And if they got past the Warriors all the way to the NBA Finals in the same year that we won the World Series with the Astros? I don't know, son. I don't know if it'll happen. But I do know this. When the Rockets are fired, Firing on all cylinders. They are a lot of fun to watch because they've got sharp passes. They've got fantastic fakes. They've got these magical drives to the goal, creative three-pointers. They've got exciting just stuff that's going all around all the time, alley-oops and all. And it's just a marvelous display of teamwork when they get it all going along together. And really, when you think about it, when any team gets synced up and unified, working together like a well-oiled machine or a well-tuned orchestra, any team is going to do well in the world of sports. The same could be said in the world of church as well. Anytime you take some believers who have put their resources together, their talents and their gifts in such a way that they realize, hey, I can't change the world by myself, but if I linked arms with you, perhaps we could make a dent together. Perhaps we could get synced up and we could work along together in a way that did transform the world. And I'm telling you, when the church does that, it's a powerful thing and people stand back and say, wow, Look at those Jesus followers. Look at what they're doing together to push back the spiritual darkness in this community and to usher in the spiritual light of Jesus Christ. It's really a beautiful thing to observe when that type of thing is happening. The problem is that many Jesus followers today are resisting playing on a team. 
Some Jesus followers say, you know, I just don't want to play. Why don't you want to? I don't want to. I just don't want to play. How long do you not want to play? I don't want to play today, that's for sure. And probably maybe next week I don't. And maybe next month and maybe next year and, and you know, maybe in another decade. And I just, I don't know, but I just don't feel like playing right. Others say, oh, I'll play, but I need a little bit more spotlight on me, please. Okay, if I'm going to play, could we make it a little bit more about me? Others come onto the court, but soon they start jostling with teammates. And before long, they're kind of mad at each other and they're forgetting, hey, we're on the same team together. At which point others sometimes get their feelings hurt and they storm off and they say, I'm going to go find a better team that I'm going to play on. Unfortunately, those descriptions also characterize the church. And that's a problem. But it's not a new problem. It's a problem that Christians have had for centuries, going all the way back to the very beginning of the church. As a matter of fact, when you go back to Corinth, Greece, the early church there in Corinth, they were having a hard time getting it all synced up together and getting unified and working along. And that's what we're going to look at today in this letter to the Corinthians. They weren't functioning nearly the way that God had created them to function. And so the great Christian leader called Paul, he writes them this letter that they would read aloud when the Christians gathered there in the, in the church in, in Corinth. And we're going to look at a portion of this letter where Paul was just writing to coach them and say, let me, let me kind of help you figure out how to get this thing synced up with one another. Okay, so we're going to start in on 1 Corinthians 12 at verse 27, which is kind of his summary sentence. And then we're going to go back up towards the top and kind of work down from there. Let me read to you verse 27. Now... He says, you are the body of Christ and each one of you is part of it. Stop right there. He's saying you and you, you and you and you and you and you. You're the body of Christ. Not you all by yourself, but you together. Second person uh, plural. Okay, that, that, and if Paul were a Texan, he would have written, y'all are the body of Christ. All of you together, when you come together and you link your arms together, you together become the body of Christ. Now go back up and let's go down from verse 12, okay? Because he's going to flesh it out a little bit. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. We were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if you're a note taker, I'm going to give you three uh, observations that I want us to draw from our text today. So there's three things that I want us to be pondering this week as we go into our week. The first one is this. You and I, he says, you and I, we are the body of Jesus here on earth. That's the first thing we've got to get. You and I, we're the body of Jesus here on earth. Now, this was a new concept for those Christians, okay? Because they're thinking, wait, are you telling us that we're the body? No, no, Jesus had a body. Some of us knew him. I mean, it was just a couple of years ago, right? That was the body of Christ. And he got crucified and then he got resurrected. That's the body of Christ, right? Paul's saying, yeah, 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 that, that was the body of Christ. But see, once he went back to heaven after the resurrection, he left us as the hands and feet. So now together, corporately, you all become, you are the body of Christ here now on this earth. That's what he was saying. When you're coming together shoulder to shoulder and you're linking arms and you're working together, you become the body of Christ here on earth. Let me illustrate. The other night I came up here on a Wednesday to pick up my son, Wesley, at the end of his small group. Our our student ministry calls their small groups curious groups. And on Wednesday nights, there are hundreds of of youth around this building, I'm telling you, the energy is palpable. This place is bustling. And <clears throat> so um, when I picked up my Wesley <clears throat> the other evening, we got in the car and I asked him 
uh, so how's your curious group tonight? He said, oh, dad, it was really great. After we played basketball, then we got into our group and with Mr. J, who's our leader, and, and he talked with us tonight. We talked about how we could let Jesus shine better through us, like when we go to school or at other places. I said, that's really good. He kept talking on, and as we were driving, my mind went back a couple of years ago to Easter and to something that, that happened. If you weren't here on Easter, I gotta tell you about um, something that, that we, we showed this video. It was a very powerful video, very touching video. It was a man who needed lung transplants, but the lung transplants, they couldn't find a match and, and he was running out of time. And it was in dire straits and they were losing all hope. And just uh, when they got to this critical moment in the story, the, the tech team explained to me several days before Easter, Ken, this is such a, an amazing story, but it is too long. You'll never have, you, you can't even preach a sermon. If we show this, we're gonna have to cut it in half and we'll do part one and part two. So right at this critical moment when they're calling out to God, God, please would you give us lungs? Please would you give us lungs? The words came on the screen to be continued. You remember that? Many of you groaned. You're like, oh my gosh, but it worked. Everybody came back the Sunday after Easter. And so they had to come back and hear, how does this story end? And so they're praying and the phone rings and they say on the phone, we found a match. You're gonna have lungs. And so he goes in and he gets these new lungs and Jay goes through this long recovery period and, but he gets strong again and now he's healthy. And like I said, his name is Jay, and now he's my son's curious leader on Wednesday evenings. So Wesley's telling me about his curious group and about Mr. J, and he's acutely aware that Mr. J has a story kind of like mine. He said, you know, Dad, he nearly died too. Both of you kind of have that in common. I said, yeah, I think I, I heard that story before. And <clears throat> so he's going on, and, and I was just thinking, you know, what an amazing thing. Here's a man who works a normal job like you do. He doesn't work in a church. He never went to seminary. He didn't go to Bible college, but he loves Jesus. And instead of taking his new lease on life with his new lungs and plopping down on Wednesday nights and propping his feet up and saying, this is my TV night. It's all about me. I got to relax. He comes up here for several hours to invest himself in about eight or 10 pubescent, odorous, junior high boys who are terribly excited and have focus issues. And he, he invests in them creating this meaningful experience for them so that they can feel the love of Jesus through him. And my Wesley loves Mr. J. And he experiences through J a type of ministry that he can't get through me because I'm not J and Jay is not me. And so as we were driving home and Wesley was just going on, I was thinking about that whole story and about Jay and, and what God did in his life. And I was just saying in the back of my mind, thank you, God. Thank you for a guy who cares enough about kids, who loves you enough and is in touch with the amazing grace and the salvation that you brought him spiritually and physically that he volunteers his time and comes up here and he invests in these kids, including my son. That, friends, is exactly what Paul was trying to explain. You are the body of Christ. Each of you is a part of it, don't you see? That's what he was saying. That's the first thing that he was trying to make clear <clears throat> to us. And then the second thing, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. If you're taking notes, that's the second thing. The whole is always greater than the sum of its parts. Now, let me read to you what he writes uh, in verse 15. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. It would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body. It would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were in ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. 
Now, we don't know this for sure, but I have to think when Paul was writing those words, he had to be chuckling to himself. It's witty, it's clever, it's crisp, vivid imagery. It's personification, it's hyperbole. I think he had to be chuckling and maybe the Corinthians, when they heard it read in church, maybe they started to chuckle as well. Imagine a foot talking to the hand and saying, hey, since I didn't get to be a hand, I'm out of here. I quit. An ear saying, since I didn't get an eye, get to be an eye, I'm done here. It's great writing. The point that he's making is every single part is necessary for the whole body to function. And he leans in even further as if people might be crossing their arms and saying, I don't know because I feel kind of obscure. I feel kind of insignificant. He says in verse 23, especially those of you who who are fulfilling a weaker or a more obscure part, a part of the body that nobody sees. You never see lungs. You never see arteries. But some of us know how important those are, right? And many of you, you work behind the scenes serving Christ. And it feels like maybe nobody sees you and nobody appreciates you and nobody's noticing. You feel a little like a lung or like an artery. Maybe, maybe when you're praying, maybe you're on a prayer ministry. And so you're praying for people and you're like, you know, I don't feel like anybody really notices what I'm doing here. Or maybe, you know, there, there's a, pe- you don't even think about this, but there's a, 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 a team of people who come up here and they put these packets, to get, thousands of these packets together every weekend for you. And it'd be easier for them to say, no respect. We're just putting packets together. But you wouldn't have, it wouldn't be ready if, you, if they weren't doing that, right? Some, many of you. I saw you out, out my window in my office. You, you, you serve on the parking team and you wear those vests and you're making sure everybody's coming in and staying safe, the kids don't get run over the parking lot and this sort of thing. Some of you, you volunteer at party on the patio afterwards, just welcoming the new people who are coming in. Others of you, you're one of our many, many, many leaders on the, on the dozens of, I think about 50 mission teams that we send out every year. You're making a lot of sacrifice to lead one of those teams. Others of you, you're mentoring students at one of our Title I schools. And you might sometimes just say, you know, I'm doing all this and I'm sacrificing it, but I don't feel like anybody really notices and does it really matter? And maybe it doesn't really matter. Maybe I'm really wasting my time and somebody else could probably do this. But if you're hearing that little voice saying that, I want you to hear me say right now, that is not the voice of the Lord. That's the voice of the devil right now. And you need to just turn that off because I'm telling you, if all of the less visible parts of the body just shut down, they said, I'm done protesting. Maybe they get together and, it, and they say, I always wanted to be the mouth. Why do you get to be the mouth? I'm, gonna be, I'm not playing until I get to be the mouth. I'm telling you, this place would come to a screeching halt very quickly in mere minutes. It wouldn't function right at all. It'd be a mess. No. Every part is needed, including you, including you. Now, I realize some of you are like, I don't really know what I could do. Well, you know what? Instead of just thinking that to yourself, why don't you confide in someone that? Why don't you tell them? You know, I, I hear what he's saying. I guess what Paul's saying is true. I, I probably do have something that I could do, that I could contribute. I, I just don't know what it would be. Talk about it with, find a Christian, maybe find a believer, a Jesus follower who's a little further along. Maybe talk about it with them. Maybe you could get a book on spiritual gifts and just read a little bit about it on your own. Maybe you talk about it with somebody in your grow group. Um, maybe you talk about it with your grow group leader. Maybe you come up and talk to somebody on our staff and say, I, I, I got to figure this out because I don't want to just go through my life and not do what I was supposed to do in, as a part of the body here. Because I, but, because I guarantee you, he does have something for you to do. 
and he did not come and live a sinless life in your behalf that you couldn't live so that he could die the death of punishment that you and I deserve so that he could rise and conquer the grave and save us just so that we could prop our legs up for the next 45 years until we go to heaven. That's not the reason that he came to do that. Ephesians tells us he created us to do good works that he's created us in Christ to do. So that's what we have to be stepping towards and stepping into. But see, a lot of American Christians, this is particularly prevalent in America, um, but a lot of American Christians, they're, they're acting in a very different way and they're resisting the truth of what I'm saying here and what Paul was teaching us. They're trying to run off with all the benefits of a personal Christian faith while forsaking everything that Paul was writing here to the Corinthians. More believers than ever, it seems like, in our country today are saying, yeah, you know, I believe, I got Jesus, but I don't, I don't really need any other Christians. I don't need any other believers, like, and, I, and I really don't need the church anymore because I got my Bible, I got my quiet time, I got my journal, I got my notebook, I got my favorite preacher podcast that I listen to. I got my Jesus, I'm good. And sometimes they say, well, but okay, so I'll go to church, like maybe I'll drop in maybe once every third or, or fourth week, all right? I, and there I got my favorite seat and my favorite room on the favorite side so I can hear my favorite preacher and then slip out unnoticed while they're saying the prayer at the end. And Because I just don't have time, you say. I just don't have any time to, to, to get involved with anybody else. And if that's you, I, I, I want you to realize you're doing something and it's not healthy. Um, you're tempting to sever yourself from the body of Christ as if you could ever enjoy a vibrant, thriving Christian life severed from the rest of the body. It doesn't work. And momentarily, I'm going to prove that to you. But first, what I want you to realize is this, and, and that is you're not just doing harm to yourself. You're doing harm to the body, if you pull yourself out, if Jay pulled himself out and said, I, I'm done, I quit. I don't care about boys. They're, they're smelly. They're rambunctious. I don't, I'm out. The Whirlines would personally suffer the consequences of that. Now, if you detach yourself from the body, it's going to be a problem. I'm going to show you something. Now, I, I need to warn you. Uh, it's a little creepy, a little different but you won't forget the sermon, okay? <laughs> in here is a hand. Um, I got it from the morgue. No, not really. <laughs> I think that's illegal. Um, I, I got it from Dr. Sean Mansour. He always tells me if I could ever lend you a hand, just let me know. And <laughs> so I said, you're up, this is the week. All right, now, I want you to look, this is a model. It's not a real hand, by the way. Okay, so, so. So, um, now, you look at that, right, and uh, you can put it on the screen. Maybe I already did. Yeah, it's kind of weird, right? If you just stare, why is that weird? I'll tell you why that's weird, because hands aren't supposed to be standing on a pedestal all by themselves. They're supposed to be attached to the body, that's why it looks a little bit weird, right? When you're looking at a hand that's just sitting on a pedestal. But you need to have that picture. We need to have that picture in our minds because here's what's happening. Many American Christians are saying, I don't really need other Christians. I don't really need the body. I'm just kind of, you know, I got my Jesus, I got my Bible. I'll just kind of do this whole thing on my, and I love, and I'll just, I'll have a vibrant Christian life all on my own. They don't realize that in their weaker, more honest moments, they're also saying things like, you know, I just don't feel like I'm growing anymore. I used to really feel like I was growing. I just don't feel like I'm growing anymore. It feels like I've kind of gotten stunted in my faith. Well, I'll tell you why that is. That is because severed limbs don't grow anymore. They bloat. It's kind of gross. But <laughs> my concern is that there are many Christians who are turning themselves into science experiments, and it's kind of gross. They're saying, I, I'm going to pull off from the rest of the body, and I'm just going to do this, on, and they can't figure out, why do I feel like I, it, it's not quite as vibrant? They're not putting together 
what Paul was saying here in Corinthians. When you cut yourself off from the rest of the body, you're cutting yourself out of the blessings that God wants to pour into your life as you actively attach yourself to the body and become useful for his kingdom purposes. It doesn't work if you try to keep all the benefits of your Christian faith to yourself, all by yourself. You were made, you and I were made to play a role in the body of Christ. We're, we're made to be attached and grafted in to the body. But I know, I know any number right, right now, any number of you, you're saying, oh, Ken, you just don't understand. I am, I'm just very, very busy. I'm just, and it's, I'm in a season. It's a tough season, it's a very intense season. See, maybe some of you are saying, I'm in crisis right now. And and there's just no way that I can serve anybody with what's going on in in my life. Now, let me pull off to the side of the road and just say something. Because there are some of you here and you are in crisis right now. And I'm not going to make light of that. And the last thing that I would want is for you to go out from here and to feel any bit like you got piled up upon and and there was guilt induced in this message. Okay? Because uh, all of us have to go through these crisis seasons. Sometimes they last a day or two. Sometimes they last a week or two. Sometimes they last a month or two. Right? But we just got to go through them. And it's all we can do just to, to muster all of our energy and to take all the grace that God gives us just to, just to put our heads down and get through the day, just to get through the week, just to get through that season, okay? So you get a pass on what I'm saying today if you're truly there. In fact, if you're truly there, I hope that you won't leave today without letting somebody pray for you. Our prayer partners will come up here at the end of the service, and I hope that you'll come up and let them pray over you and let us help you in any which way that we might be able to help you as the body of Christ. But I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to y'all okay because there's a lot of us hearing my voice right now and you say oh you just don't know Ken you just don't know how but you've been saying that for 10 years I think you built a condo where you were only supposed to pass through right and it's just become a reflexive uh, flippant excuse for not being who Christ created you to be in his body and I think you and I need to challenge ourselves and say, I need to take an honest look at, am I really so busy that I haven't any time to serve anybody else anywhere? And play for it. How are we going to stand before the Lord someday and, and explain that? I mean, what seems very important right now in our own calendar worlds, yeah, I'm just so busy. Someday it will kind of all fall into scale and we'll have to evaluate, okay, maybe I didn't prioritize my time quite right here, all right? And so I think we need to just have an honest talk about that and, and, um, and realize spiritual maturity, friends, is never going to come to any of us if we're severing ourselves, if we're pulling out if we're trying to embrace the American dream of autonomy and independence while also trying to embrace biblical Christianity, that doesn't work. They just don't go together. Now, we're gonna move to a third thing and it's gonna show us the heart behind our serving. I want you to look at verse 25. It's parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it, right? What's he talking about here? He's describing an empathy, a concern, a caring that, that, that we feel from our hearts when our hearts are full of love. And that's the third and final thing that I think we need to uh, embrace, the truth from this passage. And that is the reason that we serve one another is because we love one another. That's the reason. That, well, what's the impetus? To fill a slot? No. To assuage the guilt? Nope. Why, do we, why did Jesus die on a cross? Well, somebody had to fill the slot, so he just... He just no. He did it out of love. In fact... Um, look at John, what is it, 3, 36. Um, so this is how we know 
what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Why? Because it's all about love. That's why we do it. Why do I take Suzanne on dates? Because, well, somebody got to fill a slot, so I guess I might as well be the one who does it. No, because I love Suzanne. And I enjoy when we get to be together and go out to eat or see a movie or talking or she telling me stories that make me laugh or, you know, we're, do, we're working through the things that we got to work through. I do it because I love her. That's why you serve anybody effectively. Not for guilt, not to fill a slot, but because you have a heart that's full of love. Where do we get that love from? We get that love from being touched by a savior who's rescued us and when that hits us. We're like, oh my gosh, look at what you've saved me from. Look how much you've rescued me from. You can't help but say to yourself, I got to pass this, al- this love and this salvation and this hope and this grace along to some other people. And the way that we do that practically is through serving them. Look at what Jesus said uh, in John 13, 35. This is interesting, and I give credit to a preacher called Andy Stanley in Georgia who helped me to see this. I never noticed this before. John 13, 35. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Now, if you've never read that sentence before and you read the first part, by this, all people will know that you're my disciples, you would have thought Jesus is gonna say, if you love me. By this, all people will know you're my disciples if you love me but that's not what he says. He says, by this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Why did he say that? Here's why. Because you can sit around all day long and say, I just love Jesus, I love Jesus, I love Jesus, I love Jesus. You can do that all day long, but how can anybody look into your heart and say, yep, he really does. Nope, she's just faking. There's no way to prove it. Well, there is a way to prove it. That's why Jesus said, by this, all people will know that you're my disciples because you love one another. How do we demonstrate that love? Through serving. That's how the whole thing comes together, don't you realize? Because our own, the only way our world of hopelessness and hurt will ever become convinced that we really love Jesus is not because we stand around and say that we do, but because we actually roll up our sleeves And we put it into action, showing it to other people. Because real love shows itself in real service. So the reason that we're commanded to serve one another is because it's an open demonstration of our love. It's that simple. So my question is, who are you serving? Other than yourself. That one doesn't count. Because see, we're all really good at serving ourselves. I always make sure that Ken's needs are met, right? I'm really good at that one. And I bet you're good at that one on yourself, right? right? We're all, that's not what I'm talking about. Who are you serving that's not you, right? And if you get paid to do it, that doesn't count. That's called a job, okay? That doesn't count either, okay? So who are you serving if, if, if nobody comes to your mind, then I wonder if you're blocking the maturity process in your life that God wants to do inside of you. Why? Because you and I, we're the body of Christ. Every one of us is a part of it. Now, some will say, even as you're running that question through your, through your mind right now, you're like, okay, does it, does it have to be in the local church? Does it have to be here at Faithbridge? Must it be that? No. Some of you, you're serving um, in Bridging for Tomorrow. That's our ministry to uh, Title I schools and families down particularly south of 1960. Some of you are serving voluntarily down there. You're helping uh, people on a regular, maybe a weekly basis to um, experience the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. Others of you, some of you, 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 we have a number of people and you serve a Bible study fellowship. That's a wonderful ministry. And a lot of men and a lot of women, you're involved and you're helping other people come along in their understanding of, of the Bible and growing in grace and truth of, of God's word. 
Others of you, you serve at Young Life or other uh, parachurch organizations, and, and you're volunteering. Others of you, you're going, you're making hospital visits, and you're working in other institutions where you're spreading the love and, and, and prayers uh, for other people. Others of you, you have leadership gift, and you're coming in to other organizations, maybe other ministries, and you're using those gifts. You're serving maybe on boards or mentoring younger people. So no, you don't, it doesn't have to be here, but it has to be somewhere. So again, I'm asking you, who are you serving? If you can't put your finger on the name of one person, then friends, I think you're cutting yourself out of some of the blessings that God wants to do in your life. And so I just want to emphasize the importance. It's not about filling slots. It's about love. Now, I want to give you an opportunity because there's a number of you and you're like, well, I... I think I could probably just, you, could you make it real practical? Just give me something because I'm coming up with blanks right now. Um, yeah, I'll show you some place where you could show love to some other people. Pull out this little card. It looks kind of like a bookmark. Um, and the people who created it are in their 20s. Um, <laughs> And I love them. <laughs> so, yeah, and the ushers, I see the ushers. So if you need one, you just, you just wave at the ushers. Um, let's just talk through it. Because I want to give you a chance to, to say, I will love people with the love of Jesus in a practical sort of way. I don't want you to go out of here and say, well, that was challenging and I just have no idea what I'm going to do. Well, while you're thinking about it, what, sometimes you just got to jump in and try some things and, and through that you'll eliminate some that, that maybe aren't quite it. So let's, uh, let's go through this and I want to give you a moment to, 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 uh, to fill this out. Vacation Bible School. You know, we have, I think, 1,400, 1,500 kids signed up right now. I think we're headed towards 1,800 or something total who will come to, to Vacation Bible School. And it takes a lot of adults to make that, that week meaningful. Would you think about that? Or what about bereavement, hospitality? We're doing, a, we're doing more and more funerals and memorial services. And some of you say, you know, I just have a heart for people that are hurting. I would come up here and help things run smoothly at the funerals and make sure the food is served for the refreshments afterwards. And you say, I'd be on that team. Maybe some of you say, I'd be a greeter. I could, I'm coming this way anyhow. I could serve one Sunday a month as a greeter. Um, some of you say, I'll be on the check-in team and help people with the check-ins of the kiosks and the name tags and... Some say, I'll serve in the resource center. I could help people get the books that they need and things to help them grow further. Others say, I'd be a building host and help provide a, a cheerful, warm, uh, welp- welcoming presence in the atrium uh, for people. Connections event team, that's food and refreshments that we're doing at all sorts of things that are happening around here. There's a media team. Um, some of you, you love the behind the scenes goings on. You saw a little of it in that video before I came up. Um, d- the technology, the, the, the cameras and the sound and all that kind of stuff. You're like, I can do that. I, I know that world. I could, I could help things run smoothly here. It's language ambassador. We're really trying to get this Spanish thing up and running. And we've been experimenting. And, but I, I need a team of people who would say, you know, we're trying to get to simultaneous translation where you can actually put earphones in if you are a Spanish speaker and you can listen to the sermon as it's being translated. But we're going to have to have a team of people who say, I can do that. That's, I'm good at that. I could use my gift that way. Party on the patio, greeting people uh, who are here for the first time. Out, outside the student ministry. I told you a story about student ministry a moment ago in my own life, our own life. Uh, open gates, we've got this vibrant special needs ministry. Maybe you say, you know what? I, I would love to be shattering one-on-one with, with a kiddo that uh, has a special need, you know, Downs or, or autism or something. Just, I, I can do that. I'd love to do that and be a shadow for them. Bridging ministry, that's outside the walls of this church, all the things, maybe bridging for tomorrow or going on a mission trip or all these things that are going on here. I want you to fill this out. I'm, I'm giving you a moment right now, okay? And because in, a, in, a, in fact, ushers, would you come on forward? Because I'm gonna, in a moment, we're going to pass the baskets and I'm gonna ask you to drop these in in about 30 seconds, 
Okay. Oh, and by the way, you have to fill out the bottom because that's where you put your name. If you just check the box, we're not that good. Don't, don't pass them yet, ushers, not yet. Um, but you have to, so you have to know how, who you were. Don't, don't, don't forget that little part, especially if you fill up one of the boxes at the top. Um, and the baskets are going to come by. And if you miss the baskets, there's some slats, slits, slots in the, in the wall uh, back there. And you can just drop them in on your way um, out. So ushers, why don't you go ahead and pass those baskets now? You just drop those in. And as, as that's happening, I'm going to tell you one more closing thought. So as I was working on the sermon, I was, I was saying, Lord, is the body of Christ in America, does it ever work the way that you had in mind that it would work? Because I, I can think of any number of instances where we've kind of dysfunctioned Christians in America. Is there any? And the Lord just like that brought to mind, yes, there was this time when Christians right here in America, right here in this city, just became every bit of what God always had in mind for us to be as the body of Christ. It was about nine months ago. You remember when Hurricane Harvey came? Now, let me, before I say anything else, let me be very sensitive to say, I'm well aware that any number of you suffered a lot of loss and damage. We have a family, the Risher family. They just got back in their own home this past week. And maybe you're not even in your own home yet, back yet. But, so I'm, I, I'm, I want to be very sensitive to that. At the same time that there was a lot of damage, a lot of loss, there was one upside to what happened. And that is all across this city, Christians rallied and they came together and they gave up their independences. They gave up their attitudes, their autonomy and Christians everywhere. I know because I was talking to so many other pastors and trying to do coordinating and this sort of thing that was going on. Christians all across the city were becoming sacrificial and saying, hey, come into our home, we'll give you shelter. You need money, here's money. Have this money. You need clothing, so we got plenty of clothing for you. They, you need us to help you muck out your home? We're there. And Christians were doing that and they were dying to themselves. And maybe it's just because you couldn't do anything else. Everything was closed. You couldn't go to church or you couldn't go to school. You couldn't go to work. And so everything was at a standstill, but it gave us time to get off of ourselves and to put our actually on some other people, didn't it? And it was a powerful thing. It was beautiful and it was generous and it was inspiring. And even people in other parts of the country and other parts of the world were saying, this is really an, an impressive thing. Houston's handling this calamity better than some cities have handled their cal calamities. And, and those that aren't followers of Jesus, many of them, they, didn't, they never got it. The best they could come up with is, well, you know, in Texas, there's a lot of hospitality. And that is true. But they missed what was going on. The body of Christ, believers, we were being for a few amazing days exactly who he created us to be. I was reflecting on that as I was finishing up the preparation for this message today. And it occurred to me, must we wait for a calamity like Harvey to come along every decade or so for us to, to rally ourselves and, and to become every bit of the body of Christ that he's created us to be? I don't think so. I think we could be that 365 days a year. And the more I think about it, I'm telling you, that's the type of Christianity that I never lose my inspiration when I'm thinking about that, when I'm dreaming about that, when I'm praying for that. And I want to invite you to join me in that. Let's do that together. Let's be the body of Christ that he called us to be. Amen? Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for giving us gifts. Every one of us has gifts. Every one of us has talents. Forgive us so often, Lord, for forgetting that we do or minimizing or saying, I don't really, I don't have anything, or I'm just so busy, I just could never do anything. Forgive us, Lord. Remind us of what you went through and what you did to save us, to rescue us 
to redeem us. And you did it from love. Won't you fill our hearts, Lord, with such overwhelming amounts of love that we couldn't help but spill over and splash other people with the love of Jesus, made practical through our serving to them, Lord. If you're here today and you have never said yes to Jesus in the first place, I wanna invite you right now. You just in the quietness of this moment, why don't you just say, I wanna invite you, Jesus, into my heart. I need to have a savior. I'm asking you to come and to forgive my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I want what you came and did on the cross to apply for my life. And I wanna learn what it means to be a part of the body. And so Lord, won't you do a new work inside of me? And we pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.